Hey, hey everyone. It's great to be, uh, well, here with whoever could show up today. I am excited to be back with uh, Dr. Peter Skyer. Uh, Dr. Skyer has been a repeat um, well, lecturer on the uh, Autism, ADHD, and Sensory Processing Disorder Summit with me. Um, I've known him for a number of years now as well in terms of working with my family. And, um, and we're gonna just revisit some of the things that uh, he's been working on since we last talked on the summit uh, last year. But before we get started, so first of all, welcome Dr. Skyer. Great to be here, thank you. Good to have you here. Um, I'm just gonna give everyone that hasn't previously um, had an opportunity to hear from Dr. Skyer a, a bit of background about uh, who he is and what he's been up to over all the years. He's been doing this. Um, he's uh, dedicated his academic and clinical career over the past 15 years to working with complex neurological disorders in both adults and children. Uh, he re received his doctorate in chiropractic from Life University, as well as extensive postdoctoral training in functional neurology with concentrations in childhood developmental disorders, vestibular rehab rehabilitation, and brain injury rehabilitation. In addition to his functional neurology training, Dr. Skyer has amassed thousands of hours of continued education in the areas of functional immunology, functional endocrinology, and advanced concepts in neurochemistry and nutrition over the past decade. Since 2004, Dr. Skyer has collaborated with Dr. Robert Millil, the founder of Brain Balance Centers and Hemispheric Integration Therapy. After a decade of working with children, uh, Dr. Skyer established Skyer Integrative Health Center in Atlanta, which specializes in complex neurological and metabolic disorders, utilizing the latest advancements in neurological rehabilitation and diagnostic testing. And he's a founding member of the International Association of Functional Neurology and Rehabilitation, uh, otherwise known as I IAFNR. And he served as the president of IAFNR from 2015 to 2016. And when he's away from his, his practice and all this stuff, he is a dad to a soon to be 18 year old son, Nicholas and his 13 year old daughter, Emma. Again, welcome back. And thanks a lot for having me again. I appreciate yeah. it. Well, so let's, let's dive right in. Like what, what, what um, you, you've been obviously had a busy, I think with the, the summit was close to nine months ago. Um, the last time we went live, what uh, what have you been up to, and what do you you see changing in terms of um, how you're working with patients and uh, the types of cases you've been seeing in the in the interim? Sure. Well, one, I mean, most of what I've been focusing on probably since probably the last three and a half years has really been the young adult population, um, ranging from ADHD to learning disabilities to um, autism. Again, for me, you know, after years of working in the younger population, one of the things I realized very quickly was that that population was truly underserved. And um, in going to conferences, you know, having tremendous relationships with colleagues around the functional neurology community and other communities, that again, and the numbers were going that way where there was just so many cases of, of, of children that were young or children that were coming into adulthood that were still, having a lot of neurological deficits that were still manifesting. Um, and then even in the, in the ADHD world or the learning disability world, the kids that may have gotten through high school now are getting into colleges and really falling behind because maybe some of the support services they had in, in, their, in, in their high school or junior high years or they were attending small schools and small classrooms and stuff like that. When they went to the next level, you know, things have changed. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at right now in terms of that. I mean, I do dabble with traumatic brain injury and concussion, and um, I also work with older adults as well. But, um, but right now, one of the things I'm really passionate about is really exploring the the aspect of can we still change that um, that young adult's brain that has still had a lot of the symptomatology that they had developmentally from childhood that for whatever reason was not you know fully addressed, whether it was just because of that there wasn't enough um, services for that child or B, that um, the, the, the therapies they've got may have not as been as effective as they were hoping for. But, um, but ultimately what I'm interested in right now is really trying to show the world that even at 17 to that mid 20 year old range, you can get a lot of therapy done and you can do it in a way where it's a, a home-based model 
um, and parents don't have to like, how's my kid do this at college or how do they do it if they're still at home? How do you get them to do it? Um, mm -hmm. So that's been something that has been exciting because what I try to do is rather than take a therapeutic approach with them, I take more of like a brain optimization approach where, again, tie it into more of a performance model as opposed to a therapeutic model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, let's actually, that's for, for, for those people that aren't as familiar about what, what the brain's capable of, especially in those later years. Mm -hmm. So for anybody that's listening with a younger child, this will apply to them as well. Only it will, the changes happen more rapidly, but can you explain to people that aren't familiar with the, the concept of neuroplasticity and, and positive neuroplasticity and what that means uh, in terms of being able to, to make improvements, um, in with their children sure i mean and again you know we've now known for you know gosh you know, several decades now the ability the brain has the ability to rewire itself mm -hmm. based on um optimal stimulation brain-based stimulation but also can actually create negative plasticity if we're activating loops and may and that are um could have negative impacts on us um because we're constantly activating them but that's the thing is that we now know more than ever into our adult life that we still have the ability to create these these narrow pathways and as you said now is the, the creation of these narrow pathways as strong as it might have been when they were younger um the thought is that the brain in the early parts of the childhood has a greater degree of ability to differentiate itself but one thing that i'm finding more than ever now is that once you assess the young adult and you're able to really get into what areas of the brain that might be underactive, the frequency of how often you do it and the duration of how often you do it um, can really lead to greater plastic changes than we even thought. Um, I think that that, you know, I've worked with models where, and I've been exposed to clinical models where we've done, you know, an average of three hours of therapy a week, or, you know, there's people that are, you know, colleagues of mine and others that, you know, have patients, even in myself, that have had people come to our, our practices and do intensives for several days and stuff like that. And can you make neuroplastic changes in those mechanisms? Sure. But the one thing that I've found over the last several years now is that what if you're able to do that rehab every day? What if you're able to do that, that rehab every day, multiple times a day, okay? And again, and, and that's case by case, depending on the, 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 the degree of deficits that you may see in that particular case. But the one thing I can tell you now is as I'm collecting this data and hoping one day to be able to publish it is that it's really about the frequency and the duration of it. And maybe if anything, more of the frequency of it. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's what's got me excited about it because I am working with some 18 and 19 year old young adults that have been probably classified on the moderate end of autism um, or on the severe end of autism and their parents are just blown away with the changes that they're seeing but again we are doing it in two to three times a, a day but how do you do that two or three times a day well you're not going to do it quote unquote coming to a clinical setting you know every day three times a day that's not you know financially feasible it's not logistically feasible so what i've been able to do is because of the advancements in the technology that um that a lot of these neuro real um, neurological um, companies have allowed me to create is ways to be able to do it from a home-based model yeah and i'm just gonna so so that's and that's a really really important piece right because a lot of times we're talking about things with parents in particular, whether they're the, the yeah, parents of young adults that still need a lot of support or um, parents of young children, you, it's it's the feasibility of actually being able to do a therapy that, that makes it really exciting. And when you can do it at home and it can be done with the parents and the cost and the time and everything, it's the time just spending doing the therapy it makes a big, big difference in terms of whether or not um, it's, it's really feasible for the parents to do. Yeah, because you got to look at it this way. You have to look at it, what drives the care plan. And in most instances, again, and I've been in practice now for 15 years and, and, and early in my career, you know, I was exposed to the insurance model and then moved to more of a, of a, a private pay model. And my whole private practice now is continuing on private pay. And the one thing it does is takes the freedom away from, you know, okay, someone telling me how often I can see, see a patient and stuff like that. But the biggest freedom now being able to do stuff from a home-based standpoint, because the technology's there to do it, is that that takes away the logistic component, okay? okay. That again, even even on the optimal level, let's say we had you know, you know healthcare where you, know, you could pay for as long as you wanted to get it done. 
still, you're not going to go to a therapy center five days a week, okay, or something like that. You're not going to go multiple times a, a day to that same therapy center or whatnot. So it takes that obstacle out of the way. So, and and to me, when what we continue to see and what I hear from many of my colleagues in the functional neurology and rehab space is that, again, the frequency of doing it. You know, I think more than ever, we have some of the most greatest advancements in diagnostic assessments and then rehabilitative technology. Um, and in a perfect universe, we, we would want to be able to rehab a patient for an hour in the practice and do it five days a week, but that's not reasonable. Mm -hmm. So over the years of working with different um, principles and different programs, I've developed, I think, a model that now says, okay, how can we do it on a frequency level, a duration level, and then again, constantly evolving the program as the young adult changes, because um, that's the fun part, because as, as you create plasticity, now what was once difficult is now something that's no longer difficult. How do you grow the next layer of, of the pathway is you're, you're changing that, that neurological rehab that you're doing. Um, and so I mean, we're still doing a lot of bedside stuff with, with, the, with the patient, but at the same time being able to engage that through technology. And that's really, I think, really cool. Yeah. And maybe uh, what we, we can do is after uh, um, we can sort of go through about how that looks to a, a, someone that's working with you and I can talk to my experiences as well. Mm -hmm. But um, can you give some examples? So a lot of people won't know or won't have experienced um, this type of therapy before mm -hmm. working with a functional neurologist. Um, there's a lot of conversations around all the different types of therapies that are out there um, for for neuro rehab being at vision therapy or auditory therapy or uh, movement therapy. Can you explain to someone who hasn't actually experienced functional neurology before what 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 it is so that they understand how the, all these things integrate? Sure. Well, you know, one, you know, the, the functional neurology term or really grew out of the field of chiropractic neurology that's been around since um, uh, nine, and 30 plus years, 35 years, it really was a genesis of Dr. Fred Carrick. And then people like Dr. Malul and others were the early pioneers of, of chiropractic neurology. Um, and again, chiropractic neurology was always based on the education and, and being able to diagnose and assess for neurological disorders. But what made it really different was our approach and our approach being that we were going to use brain-based therapies. Um, and then probably about a decade ago, IAFNR came into existence and we really kind of switched, quote unquote, from a chiropractic neurology term to a functional neurology. Because again, if you're doing, if, a, if you're going to an OT or you're going to a PT or you're going to, let's say, a chiropractor or anytime even a body mover, they are doing functional neurology in that space because, again, you are working with the nervous system. So if you're working with the nervous system and your outcome and your, and your, your goal is to try to improve the nervous system, well, you're trying to prove it functionally. So the functional neurology space really now is a, a multidisciplinary space of, of, of people. And, and I know IAFNR has made a really good point of including a lot of different people um, that are doing that. So I think that number one, the functional neurology group is a group that is trying to use brain-based rehab, um, not medications to do that. Um, and then they're using a variety of different, whether it's, um, vision training or auditory training or um, let's see somatosensory applications whether it's chiropractic adjustments or, or or exercises that work on the muscle system and stuff like that so again it's a wide variety of people now the functional neurology group that I'm a part of it is still the, the part that is either being trained through IAFNR or being trained through the Carrick Institute and stuff like that. So there is a little bit of a differentiation in, in that relationship. But in general, if you are going to a practitioner, they are quote unquote doing functional neurology. It's just it's just a who's got some of more of the specializational degrees and training and, and stuff like that from institutes like IAFNR or Carrick Institute. Yeah, because I think one of the biggest things that I noticed when I started to work with you was that I, I saw pieces of what other practitioners had done with 
with us before. So be it in, in speech or be it in more in OT, like mm -hmm. occupational therapy work. Um, and then obviously uh, you, you have a functional medicine approach too, and, and which obviously uses the basis of nutrition as well. So it was integrating all those things into a, a, a comprehensive treatment plan, which you know can be supported by other things. So I think a lot of people don't realize that they may be doing pieces of this already. Um, whether they, they, they have the full picture or not yet is, is the question. So yeah, and I think that's a big distinction because I think that, again, you know, it, from my experience working through a lot of different ages of people, um, that even, even working with even adults and you get into working with people that have different neurological disorders in adulthood, um, generally they're working through one modality as opposed to really what I think is the, the framework of functional neurology is the multi modal aspect of it, using multiple modalities, and knowing for that particular patient more than ever, what is the modality sequence that's going to actually drive the changes that you want to use functionally. Um, the other part I think about functional neurology is actually really having um, assessment tools that can measure the cognitive functionality of a, of a patient, the motor functionality of the patient, autonomic activity, um, looking at sensory activity and stuff like that. So I think that for myself and for many of my, my colleagues that, I, that I've known over the years, number one, we try to have the most advanced diagnostic ways to assess the patient, not only from a bedside neurology exam, but also quantifying it through the latest and greatest technology, and then being able to apply our applications. Because the one thing about functional neurology is that really the the applications are somewhat unique to that particular um, person and be in terms of how their brain is wired or has not appropriately wired developmentally that's led to a lot of the, the deficits they may have. So it is that, I think that fingerprint that's unique to the individual patient, um, but definitely the multimodal relationship. So now you take it on a multimodal level, incorporating a variety of different brain-based applications. Mm -hmm. But then the next thing is, what is the frequency and what is the duration? Mm -hmm. and, and for someone who has worked with, I mean, I think a lot of children in the past and then a lot of young adults now, um, that is, it, it, it's an end value of one. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not there, one size fits all. Uh, there's no way to sit there and say, okay, what's the length of, of time to, 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 to say, okay, we're gonna be from here to here in this time. It's all unique, and that the neuroplasticity is, again, like you said, it, it's so it's based on ep epigenetics. It's based on genetics. You know, you, you can go down the whole realm of of all the lab testing and looking at is it you know is methylation and and all these kind of things like that that are important SNPs and stuff like that that play a role in this. Um, so it, you've got you got to kind of cover all your bases. Yeah. So, so can you run through? Um, maybe a few cases um, that you've been working on where you can uh, yeah. in the recent past, just to give people an idea of, of what this looks like when you start working and what type of results you're seeing in some of these young adults that you've been working with in the, the recent past. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited because I actually had a case that came from actually one of the, the, the last summits from last summer and that I've been working with. And, and it's really exciting because I, it's an 18 year old um, young adult on the spectrum and the father had reached out to me and he was really, really gung ho about the topic that we talked about last time was the whole idea of the cerebellum and the cerebellum's role in, in developmental disorders and the cerebellum's role in, in how the brain develops neurologically. And so we just got in there and um, we did this and we were able to do an assessment actually through me being able to walk the adult through the the assessment of their of their particular young adult. Um, and so what was exciting was that he didn't have to get on a plane and come here and stuff like that. I mean, he could have very well come to Atlanta and done it, but um, he was able to go through a series of different assessments that the best way to explain how we do this assessment is that in the brain, there's these different parts of the brain and, and whether it's the, the, the frontal lobe or the parietal lobe or the occipital lobe, um, they get into the brain stem and then we get into the area called the cerebellum. And there's very, very easy ways to assess that, bedside ways to assess that and be able to look at the integrity of that circuit. How well is it functioning? Um, and then looking at it from a, a one side of the brain versus the other side of the brain in that relationship. 
Um, and then once we go through that assessment, then we were able to determine, okay, this, this in this particular case, there was a lot of problems in uh, motor coordination, motor timing, motor planning, um, problems in eye tracking, difficulties with the vestibular system. And, and so, the, so again, it was very interesting for this particular um, parent because he had gone to a variety of different people and no one had gone to, the, I think, to the breadth and depth of this assessment. And we had to deal with primitive reflexes and stuff like that. So we started taking on the major deficits like the, the cerebellum, which contributes to balance and motor coordination and motor timing and motor planning. So we just started out doing a lot of cerebellum-based rehab. Um, and again, we started simply with trying to master the idea of balancing on one foot. You know, could he balance on one foot from one foot from one side to the other? Could he balance with his eyes closed? Could he balance in a tandem stance where he had one foot in front of the other? Okay. Um, could he then work on balancing on a proprioceptive board and stuff like that? Um, and then from there, we were able to work on, again, we had other things going on simultaneously. So we had him doing eye movement therapy while he was balancing and stuff like that. So, because again, a lot of people are doing proprioceptive based rehab, but you multi modal it by adding things like different sound frequencies or music frequencies that may activate one particular part of the temporal lobe as opposed to another part of the temporal lobe or doing specific eye movements that may um, activate one part of the cerebellum versus the other part of the cerebellum. Um, so these are things that we can layer on. And, and what's fascinating is I'm hoping that with um, this father's permission that one day to show a video of where he was at the beginning and where he is now, because where he's at now is is astonishing in terms of that he can now get on this very, very advanced balance board and he can now actually shift the balance board like it's almost like a skateboard and he can move it side by side at the same time he's actually doing um, very other complex um, motor activities and we're getting to the point in here soon where we believe we're going to be able to put him on his balance board at the same time he's doing interactive metronome therapy wow. and being able to do that and that in itself you know in every week i'm getting weekly updates from the, the father that you know this is getting better and this is getting better okay. now the question is well how does it translate into real day day and day life well one you know they're they are seeing you know cognitive changes um again he's an 18 year old and and the, the the cognitive changes were or the cognitive deficits were very severe so they are slowly moving functionality wise but the one thing that we're seeing is because we're doing it so often that he's moving He's just moving in a very linear, in a linear way, um, cognitively, motor-wise. Um, you know, we're seeing, we're using some applications that are also priming his language and developing his language more. Um, at the same time, we're we're doing cerebellum-based therapy. Yeah. Well, and actually, I think that's you. You answered a question that came up sort of as you were talking. There is that a lot of people don't understand the connection between doing these motor-based therapies. So thinking about balancing on a balance board, and that sounds great and we, we obviously want their motor coordination to improve but what that means in terms of understanding what that means in terms of their overall cognitive and emotional and another time we'll dive into the whole cerebellum thing because that's that's your yeah, that's a whole that's a, that's a long conversation <laughs> in the day that what parents have to realize is that the cerebellum is setting the basis for all human cognition okay so when we see deficits in the cerebellum and we see um, muscle tone imbalances, or we see problems in gait function. Um, for example, one of the things that um, came up a while back was I had asked him to say, hey, can you take your son and ask him to draw a clock? And he's like, oh, yeah, he'll be able to draw a clock. And he was so astonished that he could not draw a clock. And so now, after weeks of focusing on different parts of the cerebellum, he's not just drawing a clock, he's now drawing um, recently, I got a picture of him drawing um, a train and, and stuff like that. So his complexity of his drawing has gotten better because we, we started working and focusing on different parts of his cerebellum. And so I think the the major theme that has to for people to understand is that all the research that's coming out right now in the developmental world is that it's about the cerebellum's relationship to the human frontal cortex mm -hmm. and the cerebellum's role to other deep structures in, in the middle part of the brain. Um, and so when we're not when we're not rehabbing the cerebellum, 
then we're not going to see the expression of executive functions or better modulation of limbic control and better modulation in our behavior and, and all these things that are that are, our parents are wanting for their their young child and their young adult. Um, so, but the one thing that what is exciting in this particular case is that I mean this, this family had spent you know well into six figures on therapy and and different applications, and they're about to throw in the towel. I mean because they figure out this is the best that we can get them, and now at 18, and you know we started working with him when he was about 17 and a half. You know they're 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 saying that wow we we still got a long way to go and we still got a lot of things that we can do and see him changing and growing neurologically, um, and that's that's the big thing that I want people to understand is that just because they've gotten to 17 or 18 and maybe you feel like you've exhausted some of the traditional therapies is that there's more that can be done and we're I think we're just tapping barely tapping the ice the tip of the iceberg right now when it comes to understanding neuroplasticity in young adults with developmental disorders so yeah, yeah it's it's an well it's an incredibly inspiring message to parents that have tried a lot of things and at some point you do say you know am i am i doing it are we putting them through because a lot of the therapies and things that people are doing with them are, you know are very extensive expensive and also not a lot of fun to to do but like i said you were saying in the very beginning is that you have created a model and there's a way to do this that can make it actually fun for them as opposed to incredibly challenging um, yeah i think i've taken out two obstacles i think i've taken out the obstacle of of cost because okay. here's the thing is that the one thing, and again, for doing this for years, for the years I've been doing this, and being able to see cases that I worked with when they were really young to now that they're, you know, in some instances I have some kids that are as old as my son, and 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 so to see where they were and where they are, I know those parents would say, that, okay, we're still not where we want to be, but at the same time, we know that the interventions that we did then have gotten us to here. Well, what else can we do? Mm. And and so. The question is, how do you how do you take out the cost factor of it? Okay, uh, okay, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna spend tens of thousands of dollars to, to try to do a therapy for you know a small amount of time versus okay, how do we do something that is going to be more you know practical and then at the same time something that's engaging and fun and in this instance this father and and son have set up a a, a neurology gym in their in their in their garage. And, and and so that's one. And I know what we did in your basement and stuff yeah. like that. We created that. And again, it was always about performance. And and so when some of the technology they're getting their hands on, and 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 they realize that hey, well, this is some of the stuff that pros are using or or elite athletes are using and stuff like that. It doesn't look like a therapy model, as opposed to like hey, I can I'm trying to train my brain in ways to to do it. And when you can. And some of the technology we have now where we can see pre and post data, the, the, to me, that's what the parents really like. I know the fathers really like, you know, to sit there and say, okay, here was their baseline and here's where they are now. Um, and one of the things that I, I do with all my clients is that they're required to video. Mm -hmm. And so I have just probably now probably several hundreds and hundreds of hours of video of, of patients that we can see where they're where the the young adult was here and now where they are now um that make it pretty remarkable yeah no and that's it's, it's funny it's something i talk about with people all the time is keeping tracking this stuff is really important for so many different reasons but, but part of it is for the motivation to continue and when you know you're doing something right because sometimes that like you said that although you're seeing linear progress because of the consistency of what they're doing right now Sometimes the plot progress is slow, but when you look back to where you started, you realize you've come a really long way and it's you're going in the right direction. So that's really important. Yeah, and I think that that's, you know, so, you know, having that constant, I mean, a lot of times I'm, I'm talking to a lot of my clients once a week, um, sometimes bi-weekly, it just depends on the, you know, the case, but again, being able to collect that data, collect the video data, um, then collect the objective data, and then being able to change the degree of activity that they're doing, and and that's what's fun. And then for me, what what's exciting too is that every six to nine months or a year, I see to come across a new piece of technology. I'm like, ooh, I want that little toy, and I want to add that to my repertoire, and then I add it to my repertoire. And so for 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 families that I've been working with that um, with their young adults, they've been able to 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 basically say, okay, oh, what's the next little 
geeky technology you're going to send me and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, I got this for you now. And, and they, they seem to like that. And so it's because it, I think we're in the era of that. Ooh, when's I when's I um, Apple going to come out with their new iPhone and stuff like that? So everybody was looking for an upgrade. Yeah. So they're like, do I get an upgrade neurology wise? So I'm like, yeah, yeah, I think I got this piece of technology that we may want to use sure. and stuff like that. So yeah, no, there's always good stuff coming out. Um, we have a question from yep. someone that's watching. Um, Becky's asking. She says her almost 13 year old son has a sensory issues plus anxiety and OCD behavior. Can you su suggest some calming activities? I've tried to have him do slow breathing exercises, but sometimes he gets more upset at me. Uh, the only thing that he will do on his own is roll his body around in blankets for a while. How do I get him assessed and find help? I think we can, uh, we're in, we have county insurance in Sacramento, California. Um, he has a younger brother that has ADHD behavior. And uh, so they end up bothering each other each day, frustrating and exhausting. And uh, Becky, we hear you. Yeah. And again, I think obviously one, you begin to start looking at what you just described there with the rolling in the blanket and stuff like that. And a lot of times it's obviously a need for vestibular activation. And so I think that first and foremost is being able to drive that vestibular system, drive the motor system, when we look at doing things like you know, cross crawl activities or even getting them to do, um, you know, jumping on a trampoline or things like that, some gen general things that are going to stimulate, you know, and usually when we're using our large muscles and we're using our big muscles, if we're doing some jumping jacks or doing something like that, we are going to fire more into the, the right hemisphere to do that. And there's going to be a a relationship with the right hemisphere dampening down some of the that the limbic activity and the um, the basal ganglia in terms of that's producing a lot of the excess motor activity so i mean that would be you know some generalities in terms of that just getting large muscles to move um because again a lot of the times in these in many of these kids is that they'll they'll want to use screens as a calming tool and stuff like that as a, but getting large muscle activity is the big thing and uh you know working on core aspects um there's tons of great practitioners in california to, to reach out to and stuff like that i know um there's brain balance centers out there as well in california for that younger population to, to reach out to and stuff like that but those are people that you know again a lot of their therapy is going to be based on you know really assessing that vestibular system assessing the the, the motor um, tone um you know my experience with you know, cases of adhd or ocd or on the autism end of it is that they are going to have more of the low muscle tone they're going to probably have the hypo um, vestibular they're going to have under vestibular activation so they're going to be craving a lot of vestibular um, stimulation so that's why they may rock they may want to um, be spun or they may roll themselves in blanket and stuff like that as a as a soothing mechanism so it's a real sign of generally probably hypo in terms of underactivity. Sometimes you may catch a hyperactivity where, you know, now they get, you know, any type of movement makes them nausea and stuff like that. So. Yeah. When it comes to um, sort of gaming those types of activities, like, cause I, as, as she mentioned, he gets annoyed when she tries to get him to do certain things. So um, what are some of the techniques or strategies that you use with your patients in the clinic or tell your parents to do to, um, get kids more engaged, kids and the young adults, because actually young adults can be actually in a lot of times be even more difficult. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's they, the funny thing they, about it is working. They get really homes, stubborn. <laughs> they, you know, again, they get even more sedentary in their ways and, and, and stuff like that. Um, I mean, it, it, I don't even know if there's any magic to it in terms of like, because each particular case has been individualized and stuff like that. Oh, I'm going to have to plug in my... Oh, that's okay. Yeah, so blackout here, um, but um, but no. One of the things is um, again for me is is always trying to to engage them one on one and, and trying to find that one thing that I think is going to be. Um, sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, um, that is going to you know find a way for them to, to want to do it. I mean, it's, it, there's no, I, I wish I had a perfect answer to sit there and go, Hey, this is exact exercise. That's going to that calm them down. I kind of just try to find the one or two that are going to, that are going to do it, you know, that are, that they're willing to try doing and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I, I've gone as far as dancing with, 
adults, you know, when back when I was working with kids, kids trying to find, you know, a way to like, okay, copy me or, or, you know, run, you know, run around with me and stuff like that, just to get their, their large muscles moving and, and stuff like that. So there's not like one simple answer to that. I think that I wish I could give that. I would say that, you know, the, the, the best thing you can do is just try to get, if you, if the weather's nice, get them outside, try to get them, you know, engaged in, in some type of activity that, that they'll be willing to try and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think some of the suggestions you did give earlier in terms of like mini trampolines are always really great if it is a kid that really is sensory seeking, like really wants that that movement and stuff, and and yeah. bakku balls and and yoga balls and and things like that tend to make a big difference. It's more things they can sort of use that, that when they start getting that good, they feel good about what they're doing. They're likely going to do. Um, even more of it on their own without you even having to prompt them. And sometimes that I find, you know, I found with my uh, kids is that it's also just asking them how they're feeling while they're doing that thing. So they actually realize that it's making them feel better because sometimes they don't realize that that's what's making them feel better. So they don't seek it out on their own. Um, no, I agree. And, and like I said, I, you know, I have the, the different tools where you can, you may want to have an exercise ball, you may want to have an indoor trampoline, or you may want to have, uh, you know, boost a ball or something like that. And, and then just, just find that one thing that they're going to gravitate to and then try to use it with them and, and try to, you know, change, you know, sometimes you have to change the stimulus, you have to change the exercise mm -hmm. from one second to the next and stuff like that and have that flexibility where you're doing it. Um, and, and again, that's that's the challenges of, of working with you know you know younger children and, and stuff like that. But at the same time, with the with the adults is is just as challenging because of of boredom per se. And, and so I think that um, again, there's no one answer. You just have to try to. But again, the the best thing you can do is as the more repetitive you are doing the the larger muscles, the bigger muscles, you're more going to activate into that that right brain. Um, you're going to activate the right insular cortex, which is going to give them a more sense of awareness of themselves, their body awareness and stuff like that. Um, again, I, I mean, I do some simple things with even, um, even with the young adults is just, you know, having them do like finger to nose, doing ram things or playing like simuli, um, simulated they're playing a piano with their hands, stuff like that, trying to get some type of motor response to, to, to change that integration in their brain. Um, because you can, I have, I've had some young adults that can have some pretty wicked obsessions and compulsions, and mm -hmm. and again, how do you how do you get them off that fixation point? You have to give them some type of, of sensory trick to change that that relationship. So, yeah, absolutely. So, can you? So, you you talked us through one of your recent cases. Do you have any other examples of working with um, young adults that um, that you think that would be of interest to? The people listening to the guy yeah i mean again i mean the thing that i want you know first to say is that what i'm what i'm trying to look at is is the relationship of how intense the therapy has to be or the, or the performance um, activities have to be so one of the things i'm looking at like for example i have a, um, a case that i'm working with where there was a lot of obsession and compulsion and anxiety in in this particular case and again the, there are different mechanisms, and we can explore it at a later time. Of what, what is the neurology behind that in terms of what are the pathways that are involved? But the general activation into using large muscle groups and and, and firing into certain regions of the brain that control that inhibition, um, but to where we're getting those perseverations. Same thing is that we were that this particular case where they were doing a lot of. Uh, uh, functional medicine and they were doing a lot of advanced, you know, diagnostics there, but they hadn't really layered in the functional neurology piece of it. And then so once we started doing the functional neurology piece of it, it, it made a it made a bigger impact on everything that we were doing because we were able to start seeing where by doing large motor therapy, by asking in this particular case, we were able to do a lot more advanced stuff. We were able to start out by actually balancing on a, on a boosa ball while we were actually doing, um, how, tossing a ball back and forth to each other and stuff like that. Um, having a specific technology that allows us to um, monitor the accuracy of proprioceptive and vestibular movements with the body um, through a, a, a laser that projects on a wall, we were able to incorporate that into some particular therapy there. So in this particular case, um, 
this young adult came in and again the anxiety and the thing and the ocd really was impacting and the an emotional reactivity um daily that was really affecting her day-to-day -day life and affecting her interaction with her peers and and her her parents and again when we presented this to her we presented this from a performance model and again that got her that her buy-in and now we're able to do these advanced tech, these advanced protocols with her. And again, we're constantly seeing the anxiety go down, the emotionality go down. Um, and the same thing, what we've been also able to do is begin to lower some of the, the dosaging of maybe some of the GABA support that she was getting from a functional medicine level, or um, you know, even seeing changes in in her neurochemistry to sit there and go, okay, guess what? She may not need as much serotonin support as well. So, I mean, those things are, are great in there, but a lot of times I find that those might be just crutches sometimes for the symptoms as opposed to changing the, the neural pathways. And so being able to, to impact that, and that's been a great thing because again, the, the parents were looking up for a non-pharmaceutical um, approach to um, dealing with the, the, the uh, symptomatology, and that's why they obviously went to the functional medicine piece, but there was something else that was missing. And so once we went in behind it and really said, okay, hey, guess what? Um, there were some cerebellum symptoms, there were some vestibular symptoms, there were some um, alterations in ocular motor control and stuff like that. Once we started doing that, that made a big difference and started calming, you know, calming those circuits down to where, okay, now, you know, again, it's normal for us to have some level of anxiety. It's normal for us to get caught on a thought and stuff like that, but not to have this exacerbation of it constantly or that fight or flight response that wants to kick in very quickly and stuff like that. So yeah, those are things that we've been able to begin to do and, and calm that system down. And again, this is um, you know another 18, 19 year old um, patient. And so they were very happy to see that we were able to make those changes um, in a very quick instance in this particular case, um, because where we started from, so. That, yeah, and that's, and that's amazing. And I think that actually one of the things that you, um, that brings up is, is from personal experience too, I can say that uh, doing a lot of uh, obviously nutrition and um, what a, you know, would be considered functional medicine style approach for a long time, it only gets, um, it, it only, you, you sometimes can get stuck in a, in a nutrient therapy cycle because you haven't actually been able to fix the problem. Like for example, with digestion, I've, I've said this before, digestion just doesn't seem to fix itself. You end up on digestive supports for a really long time without fixing the brain and, and the vagus, um, the vagus nerve just is, it's not functioning the way it should be and your vagal tone is poor. And as soon as we started doing these types of um, exercises and uh, sorry, rehab, rehab exercises, it made a massive difference and allowed us to start stepping away from some of those things. So uh, I, I, it's interesting to hear from a different perspective, not just through digestion, but other types of um, neurotransmitters that are being impacted by uh, doing the rehab as well. Yeah, because my worry is that, you know, in the functional medicine world, and again, and, and I'm a part of it, I've trained with some of the the icons in the arena. And and so my worries is always is are we are we substituting sometimes that and are we taste, chasing symptoms all the time mm -hmm. as opposed to looking at, okay, and this is my bias from a functional neurology model is to sit there and say, okay, how much of that symptomatology is related to the lack of connectivity in that particular circuit? Mm -hmm. And 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 then is the biochemistry going to have a going to have a role? And sure, it's going to have a role. Is it going to probably look exacerbated because of the underdevelopment in those circuitry? Because again, at the end of the day, um, the literature is really clear on what parts of the brain are underdeveloped in these different disorders. And mm -hmm. one of the things that we're seeing more now in the literature is we're seeing more and more adults um, where they're doing brain rehab or brain research on adults now and looking at imaging studies. And, and that's really exciting because again, we're seeing research that comes out and says, guess what? An, an adult with ADHD has underdevelopment in their cerebellum or, or has underdevelopment in their, their frontal steroidal pathways from their frontal lobe to their basal ganglia and, and stuff like that. So again, that we're not just looking at the research from a childhood perspective. We're looking at it now from an adult perspective. Mm -hmm. We're looking at Yes, do we know that depression and anxiety disorders and, and neuropsychiatric disorders, is there a role in, in 
neuroinflammation and, and changes in how the immune response is and endocrine and, and the gut microbiome and all that, without a doubt. But what I don't want, and one of the things that I'm concerned with is that we've kind of on a, we get on these bandwagons a little bit and, 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 and some of the, the icons in this world start just going down this tunnel and kind of forgetting over here, we have this whole thing called the brain and we have these different parts and I can, I can produce just as many studies that show, guess what, depression, you know, in depression, guess what, we have these underactivities in the cerebellum or we have underactivity in, in the right frontal lobe or, or the left frontal lobe and, and stuff like that and, and, and stuff. So you got to account for that. You can't just sit there and go, okay, I'm going to do a gut microbiome protocol with everybody and they're going to heal the depression or the anxiety. I, I just don't live in that vacuum. And, yeah. so, and stuff like that. So that's my worry that, you know, not to say that summits are bad and all that stuff, but, you know, but to say that, you know, we can get in that little um, myopic space, I think, and, and, and not realize that there are other mechanisms involved. So I think the best thing that everybody should do and whether you sus suspect that you, that, you know, whether it's your child or your, your young adult or even yourself is to really, you know, get get to someone that understands functional neurology that can do a functional assessment of your brain. There's a lot of talented practitioners out there that have been well trained in this this art to be able to assess is is your frontal lobe working right? I mean, it, you know, the other day, I mean I accidentally closed my um back of my um, SUV on top of me and for about a day or two I was like, ooh, I'm a little loopy, you know. So I stuck myself in front of my technology and did some brain rehab and stuff like that. So, you know, I think that that's the thing. You know, I think that we have to realize that we have this amazing organ here that is controlling so all facets of our physiology. Um, it's it's biodirectional. Um, and I'm just worried and, and I know others in my field are worried that we're not talking enough about the brain controlling all this and understanding that if there's underdevelopment in, in, in key areas that, you know, again, we can put people on medications, we can put people on the most advanced supplement protocols and stuff like that, and, and still might not be, you know, hitting the mark, so. Yeah, well, I, I guess it, the bottom line is that if there's been the impact of negative neuroplasticity, so something didn't develop properly and then it's been sort of repeated over time, if we don't rehab it to correct that when we have the right underlying factors in place. So you can fix the biochemistry and the diet and the microbiome and all those things, but you need to actually fix those neural pathways too. Otherwise, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any particular supplement right now that that's going that's to, fix the brain. that's going to change neuroplasticity. The only thing I'm aware of that goes in and changes neuroplasticity is the engagement of the brain through its sensorium. Okay. Through visual stimulation, auditory, tactile, vestibular in the rest of the somatosensory system. Um, and when you're combining it and you actually know the ways to combine it for that particular brain and then that specific area of brain, okay? Um, again, what I want you know families to understand is that let's move away from the labels. Let's move away from, yeah, I think the labels are a great starting point to have a conversation. But at the end of the day, let's talk about functionality. Let's talk about the functions of the brain. You know, I tell my patients that I think I'm just a, a, a geeky electrician that knows that hey, these circuits are are the circuits in the brain that are that are related to the right frontal lobe, the left frontal lobe, the right cerebellum, the left cerebellum, the right brain stem, the left brain stem. I'm gonna go in there, we're gonna and through a neurological examination, bedside neurological examination, using advanced diagnostic equipment to be able to say, okay, hey, you know, what parts of your brain may not be working as well. And then we start providing an intervention, some type of rehab intervention that sees to see if we're moving them, moving them the mark, you know, are we, are we improving that functionality? Did we improve the vestibular symptomatology? Did we improve by going and activating the frontal lobe? Did we improve executive function? Did we see changes in behavior or, or changes in socialization and, and stuff like that? And so, um, these are the frontiers I think that we're seeing more and more because, again, with the rise of TBIs and and, and our understanding of traumatic brain injury and concussion, um, seeing all the advancements in um, or understanding more about neurodegeneration and, and stuff like that, again, because I work with a large population of neurodegeneration. And again, to me, it's not just all about fixing their gut microbiome. You got to go in there and change some of these pathways or try to find what pathways are still viable in that population and, and fire them. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it, it really.
kind of froze there for a sec. There we go. I'm not sure what happened there. <laughs> I know we were all there, and the next thing you know, you froze. Froze. And that big smile of your face, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At least I was smiling. I was excited about the whole plastic change part. <laughs> but, so okay. go ahead. Uh, so what I was just going to say again. I think that that's the biggest thing is that the takeaway for our our, our families is to for the young adults is realizing that. We can, we're on just on the beginning edge of understanding that even when they get to 17, 18, 19, in the early 20s, that if if we can get a really good you know, diagnostic assessment, then we can begin to build these these programs that are that are unique to their individual expression of their brain relationships and and then be able to to change. And and I continue to hope that as more and more as I'm able to work with more of this population that I can help be part of that conversation to show that we have not just hundreds, but thousands of young adults that are seeing their brain change and grow and and be able to get to whatever functional capacity that we get. I think it's, it's on, you know, to sit there and say that, oh, okay, once they get to the young adult age, you know, there's nothing we can do, just stop doing it every day and stop, you know, giving them the vitamins and the minerals and everything and stop, you know, doing therapy. I, I just think that's a wrong approach. Um, I think that we can do more. Um, and that's what I'm excited about. And, and I'm excited about working with the the population of young adults that are in college and, and, and working with the ADHD population, a lot of anxiety disorders there, a lot of obsessive compulsive relationships. And one of the other fascinating things is that a lot of the, um, I've worked with some of the um, of some of the parents of some of the cases I've worked with, because they themselves have, are are noticing that they're there, that they had ADHD or learning disability, or um, they have some anxiety or, or in depression, and then how it's affecting affecting their lives now and and stuff like that. And what can they do to, to do that? So yeah, and I think we're going to have to have another conversation about that entirely soon, uh, because it's a really big topic. And a lot of the parents who aren't taking care of themselves because they're obviously focused on their kids. No, and I agree. And one of the things I like about trying to do the program with the with the young adults is engaging the, the caregiver to do a lot of the activities with um, with their um, with their child and, and stuff because again they are able to to work hand in hand and. And you know, one of some of the things that you know, especially when they're demo, demoing some of the the applications, that, you know, some of the the caregivers will go, "You want me to do what?" And I'm like, well, "I want you to do that." And they're like, "I don't know if I can do that." I'm like, "Okay, so we're going to work on your brain a little bit and get you going, so that way you can demo it for your young adult." But it's uh, it's fun, it's it's exciting, and and I think that that's where, again, I hope that more and more practitioners will pick up on the fact that we need to serve this population of young adults. So there's a great degree of young adults that are aging up in, in that autism. We're, technology is not on my side today. Sorry yeah, it's not on our side today. But um, but no, I think that um, these, are, these are frontier questions and, and I think that we can, you know, you know, thank you for having me so we can have this this conversation and let, you know, let parents out there know that just because their child has gotten to that 17, 18, 19 year old range or 20 year old range, not to give up, um, that there's more that we can do and, and we can work with that. And I don't know what the timeline is. I don't, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know, is it three months, six months of the year, you know, and stuff like that. You know, my goal is to continue just working with individual cases and trying to, to figure out what are the realistic expectations and, and how far can we, can we take these, these young adults and, and improve their life and stuff like that. So. Yeah. Well, and, and on that note, you and I have talked about doing this on a more regular basis. 
So if people have questions, please continue to send them in and we'll address them the next time. And I don't know if you had time, Dr. Skyer, to, to, to look at the comments after this recording goes uh, onto Facebook so people can ask questions that they're watching it later on. Yeah, absolutely. I'll definitely have some time and stuff like that. And then for those who want to, you know, reach out to me and stuff like that, they can just go uh, email me at DRP Skyer at Skyer Integrative Health Centers and reach out to me. And and um, because again, you know, my focus right now is really that that younger adult population and, and really trying to integrate. And you know, I have a practice here in Atlanta where patients can and come and see me in Atlanta if they're local or they want to fly in. And for those that are that out around the country, and I have um, clients in, worldwide that, you know, we're able to do this through distance um, because I can get the technology in their hands and ship to them and stuff like that, and then be able to re control remotely from through my e-practice and then stuff like that. So that's really cool with, with technology these days. So, um, and it's fun. And I think that that's the thing about it is that from a performance standpoint that we can show, um, and my goal is to continually show that we are making changes in these in these cases. So Yeah, and I, and I can obviously say, as people know, I've worked with you personally. So um, it's fantastic to work with. And the ability to do it remotely and do most of the work at home really makes a massive difference. So yeah, I agree because I think it, done that. It, and then I think also in that that environment that the that a lot of times would even with the young adults they still need a routine and, and they like their routine. So being able to do it in that in the confines of their home is great. But I think that also engaging it with with their parents or other caregivers, it, it makes it even more fun and 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 again always trying to to change the the platform that we're working from in terms of if the if when they are changing and they are improving what what is the more difficult things that we can do to to make it even better and more successful um and then now with the a lot of the online technology that's available to be able to to measure it and measure the outcomes and you know one major piece that i've been trying to incorporate into this is trying to measure a lot of this on a cognitive level because the motor stuff is very very black and white we can measure that we can see that we we can record that through video now to be able to have cognitive assessments and and then be able to then see how they're changing that's that's a, the next frontier so that's wonderful well i look forward to the opportunity to do this again with you get sometime soon we'll make sure we make announcements on the page and if you aren't on our email list yet make sure you sign up at myjobwithdrive.com and we'll make sure that you get a notification of when we're going to do this again well again thanks for having me and i look forward to to doing this and definitely we'll we'll come up with some fun topics to talk about so sounds great thanks again thanks again